So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we've got Armchair Travel in the Galapagos with Dana Zeiser. Um, I am Dana Mastriani from the Rockport Library. I'm the assistant director here. And uh, we are fortunate enough to be able to travel uh, by sitting here at our desk or on our couch, et cetera, um, living vicariously through um, people who are willing to share their experiences and their slides with us. So this is tremendous tonight. Um, as I noted, um, this will be recorded, and I'd like to make special thanks um, out to the friends of the Rockport Library for supporting us tonight with Dana. Um, our plan is to allow him um, probably an hour or so. If people have questions, what I'll ask you to do is use the raise your hand function um, um, on the um, Zoom platform. If you don't know how to do that, just type in the chat um, um, that you've got a question. And if all else fails, just um, say, excuse me and ask your question. We'll also reserve some time at the end um, to ask a number of questions to Dana and see what he's got to say. And um, I, um, what I plan to do here is just introduce him and um, then we'll be on our way. So um, join world traveler Dana Zaisa as he travels to the Galapagos Islands made famous by Charles Darwin in the theories of evolution in his book, The Origin of Species. He will examine the unique wildlife and gorgeous vistas of his isolated groups of islands located 600 miles west of Ecuador's Pacific coast, which is home to large tortoises, iguana lizards, sea lions, and a menagerie of exceptional birds from blue-footed boobies to red-pouched frigate birds. It is a nearly pristine showcase of biodiversity as told through the photos. About Dana, He's a retired pharmacist from Norton, Massachusetts, who loves to travel and share his experiences with others. He and his wife, Kathy, have traveled to Switzerland, Australia, the Galapagos, Ireland, and the Amazon. In addition to his love of travel, Dana is an amateur historian who has published five times on the subject of the American Civil War and is the current president of the Old Colony Civil War Roundtable out of Dedham, Massachusetts. So I'm going to turn this over to Dana, and I will remind everybody just to mute themselves. Um, this way we don't hear any clanging dishes or barking dogs in the background. Um, so thank you, Dana. I'll turn things over to you, and we greatly appreciate your time tonight. All right. Well, thank you for having me. This is uh, going to be a good time, I hope. Uh, we're going to uh, fly in first to get to the Galapagos. We have to fly into Quito, Ecuador. Uh, which is the capital of Ecuador. And then we're going to make our way to the Galapagos Islands. Now, Quito, ooh, there we go. Uh, Quito means middle of the world. The uh, In Incas had actually named it before the Spaniards got there. They had already figured out that the earth was round and they were living just about in the center of it, which was pretty amazing. Uh, they uh, I mentioned Quito is the capital of Ecuador. They have a brand new airport, lots of construction. It's a bustling city. There's only one thing they're really missing that I found, and that was oxygen. They're at uh, 9,300 feet above sea level, so about twice the size, uh, twice the height of Denver. So uh, you immediately noticed it. You get off the plane, you start to feel a little sluggish. Uh, you get, start in with a headache. Uh, it's uh, very uh, noticeable, let's put it that way. Uh, some people have a lot of problems with it. Uh, Quito is located near what they thought was a dormant volcano until it erupted and covered the city with three inches of ash. Uh, but a part of it is a United Nations World Heritage Site, and we're going to see some of that. <clears throat> this uh, map shows you where Ecuador is, a little dot is Quito. And just to the uh, left, you'll see the Galapagos Islands showing on the map. So that's where we're going to end up. Uh, this is a postcard. I cheated on this one. Most of the other pictures of of I, are mine. But uh, even though this the city of Quito is located at nine thousand three hundred feet, it's considered to be in a valley because the mountains around it are even higher. <clears throat> The streets, it's sort of almost like the streets of San Francisco. You're either going up or down. Uh, you can see if you go up this one, 
when you get to the top, you can see how it's tilted that way. There's not a straight street that I saw there. And it seemed like the bus driver was giving us a tour. Either had both feet on the brake or both feet on the accelerator trying to get around the city. This is the United Nations uh, Heritage Site. These are some of the first buildings that the Spaniards built uh, in the New World. So that's why it's a, an important area. Uh, they, uh, when they first got there, uh, they, they now have this big uh, uh, park there and a uh, little oasis there. Um, in the, what we're looking at now is a combination monastery and convent. And uh, they built, that was again, one of the first buildings that was built in the new world uh, in this area. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go right through the center, right where the, between those uh, towers and we're gonna go right in through the front door there and you get into the area and you're in this beautiful uh, oasis really of uh, just immaculately uh, trimmed plants. Uh, and the walls are so thick there, uh, you don't hear any of the noise of the city. Uh, you do have the tourists tramping through. That's probably the, the most noise that you hear when you're there. It's it's unbelievable. So after this, they took us to this uh, church uh, and they said, oh, this is one of the, this is the church that's inside the monastery. And they said, no pictures. Well, I know what that means. I've been to Disney. Uh, I know that we're going to be let out through a gift shop surprisingly we weren't and I didn't get a chance to like buy a picture of this church but I happened to be looking at a book and all of a sudden what do I see but a picture of the church and you're looking down here at the altar and uh and all it's all real gold that they use there uh it it was all gold that they probably stole from the Incas years ago but they uh, uh this is the church that they uh that they had there <clears throat> Now, this the Incas also uh, built a series of altars for religious altars, and they uh, had them all along the equator. And of course, you get a picture like this. There's always some guy who's going to stand with one foot in one side, one on the other. We won't mention names, but uh, they. Uh, this is where the Incas thought the equator was. Now, what I found interesting is the uh, some college uh, students went down there. They have computers, they have the GPS, and they measured where was the equator. And guess what? It's not there. The Incas were off by 700 feet. And when you think that they probably analyzed that by putting a stick in the ground and watching the shadow, uh, that's how they probably computed whether they were in the equator or not, um, uh, 700 feet, which I found amazing. Now, the uh, Galapagos Islands, we're going to jump on a plane to go there, but they jealously guard the uh, ecology there. So the last thing they want you to do is to bring anything in with you that you shouldn't. So what they do is they open up all the overhead bins, and you have one stewardess there is spraying uh, some poison into the overhead and the other one slams the door and uh, they they keep the uh, so that your clothes get in contact with this poison uh, I don't know whether hopefully we weren't breathing too much of it in but uh, they don't want you to bring any bugs or insects onto the island that you shouldn't when you get off the plane there's a big welcome mat and you walk through the welcome mat and you start going squish 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 it's all saturated with a uh, chemical to kill any bacteria that might be on the soles of your feet. So they, they really protect the Galapagos as much as they can. They uh, called them the enchanted islands. That's because you'd be on one island and you could look and you could see the other one off in the distance. And the fog would come in and all of a sudden the island would disappear. And then the fog would lift and you could see the island and vice and keep on going back and forth. So they called it the Enchanted Islands. They were discovered in 1535. Whalers and pirates would resupply there. They'd get some water and they would, uh, the turtle population was pretty much decimated by them. They would take the tortoises and they would 
uh, carry them down to the ship and they would turn them upside down on their shell so they wouldn't be able to walk anywhere. But a, a tortoise can live for uh, about six months without, uh, probably closer to a year without any water or food. So they, uh, they would use them as fresh meat when they were out uh, whaling. They established a post office in 1793. It was basically a barrel. Uh, if you were going out in, to uh, hunt for whales and you wanted to write a letter home, you'd write it out and you'd drop it in the barrel. Somebody who was who had a full load of uh, whale blubber, et cetera, would, would come back and they would stop there for resupply and they would fish through and they would find a letter that was addressed to someone in the town that they lived in. And then they would take that home and see to it that it got delivered. Uh, so they started having permanent settlers there in 1807. Darwin arrived in 1835. He was aboard the HMS Beagle. And that was a military expedition. The king knew that whoever had the best maps usually wins the war. So what he did is uh, he commissioned the ship to go out with uh, his military men to, and uh, cartographers to draw the best maps they could. Charles, Charles Darwin was the naturalist. He uh, had some interesting experiences there, things that he found. Uh, somebody told him one time when he was there, if you show me the tortoise shell, I will tell you what island he came from. And yeah, he dismissed that right away. It wasn't until you no know, a few years after that, when he was home, he was actually visiting a museum in Spain and he saw all the different uh, tortoise shells lined up and, and he could see the difference and he could say that guy was right, that they were, uh, if you showed him the shell, they could tell you where it was from. They have a strict visit, visitor guideline there. I think I mentioned to you, they really jealously guard the ecology. So only ships with less than 100 passengers are allowed there. You have to have, uh, well, you can imagine if one of those big ships that you see now dropped 3,000 people onto the small beach, what it would do. So they, uh, uh, they just wanted uh, small ships. One naturalist has to be there for every 16 people. If a ship visits a, a beach, they can't go back for another 10 days. Uh, you have to stay on any of the paths that are with the uh, guides, and the ships are all tracked by GPS. This was the ship that we were on. It was uh, specially built for the Galapagos Islands. It's almost 300 feet long, about 49 feet wide, and it's uh, there's no docking facilities on the island. So it was constructed so that uh, barges could be brought out from the mainland, uh, from the islands to resupply the ship. They have about 70 crew members and we had on our ship 92 passengers. So how do you get to the, uh, the, the islands from the boat? They had these Zodiacs and they have real big engines on them and they're really cool. Uh, I'd love to get one. They, you could really bomb around uh, a lake with these. They uh, did not recommend you had a baseball cap. Uh, because you're speeding in, usually your cap would go flying and end up in the in the ocean. So they recommended you have something, especially if it had a strap under your chin to keep it on your head. So I'm not sure. If, uh, usually I do this live and I ask people, how were the Galapagos Islands formed? And after looking at this picture, most of the people will say volcanoes. And that's exactly how it was formed. You can see in this picture, the caldera. It's quite uh, pronounced in this picture. That was probably the best one that we saw. Um, now, after that, we would get jump into the Zodiac and we'd try to get to the beach before the natives got there, which was kind of hard to do. You know, you try to get to San Diego, San Diego uh, Island and you had... Uh, sea lions, uh, seals and sea lions all over the, the beach sunning themselves. Uh, we had, uh, at that point, we had trouble finding a good spot to land because you don't want to get too close to the animals. 
the guides that are there, besides telling you about the animals and the plants and the birds, they're also there to make sure you don't do anything stupid so that you don't get too close to the animals. These animals can be, uh, if you if they feel threatened, they have real big teeth and they will uh, take a number out of you. Now, this is a Galapagos mockingbird. Uh, I'm not a real big bird person, so I'm not sure exactly how it differs, but I'm told that all of these, they have unique characteristics. So that they're only found in the Galapagos, this type of mockingbird only found in the Galapagos Islands. So the Galap Galapagos dove, you can see the eye, you see that blue ring, very distinctive. Uh, again, only found in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, this this guy, he looks bigger than he is. He's about the size of a grasshopper, and uh, they call him a painted locust. He uh, very very pretty. Uh, so I had to. He was posing for me. I lucked out. This guy was a lava lizard. He was running around. These guys are pretty unique. Uh, they're hunted by the uh, hawks. And if a hawk grabs them and grabs them by the tail, the tail will have a tendency to break off and allow the lizard to run away. The tail has its own nervous system and the tail will keep moving so that the hawk doesn't realize that the lizard has got away. So just part of the natural defense that the lizard has. The tail will grow back too. Um, this is a Galapagos hawk. He's uh, at the uh, apex of the uh, hunters there. Uh, I expected to go there and see this lush tropical paradise. So you can see all the leaves here, right? Yeah, uh, I, I was like, like, what's going on? We were at the end of the dry season. Now, when, it be, when the uh, dry season hits, the leaves all fall off the trees and they go dormant. And then when the rainy season starts, all of the leaves come back. But the cactus doesn't have to worry about the dry season. What they do have to worry about is tortoises eating them. So their cactus, the needles on the cactus that are very low are very hard to make it very difficult to defend them. It, defends them against the tortoises. The needles at the top where the flowers are are very soft. They're almost like hair. And that's to allow the birds to get in there and pollinate the, uh, the, the flowers. And see what they look like. Those, are the, those would be very soft and the ones at the bottom would be harder. We came across some lava herons there was a big crack in the uh, lava flow as we were walking along this uh, big, uh, part of it was a beach, part of it was lava flow. And uh, these guys were about five feet below us. And most of the time I'd, I would have my large lens on so I could take pictures of everything so far away before they flew away. Something like this, I had to quick take my large lens off, put my regular lens on. It's amazing how close you can get to the animals. A lot of them have no fear of people. So uh, you you get, uh, here I am with a big lens and it, it was pretty much useless most of the time. These were some sea lions that were playing. We watched them for a while. They were just playing tag and get developing their skills for uh, hunting fish and all. But what uh, it never even dawned on me. I take so many pictures to switch over to video mode. mode. I did a little bit later, no, but not on these guys. Now we saw this Sally Lightfoot crab. This These live in the uh, Galapagos. And I took one look at it and I said, I'm never going to convince anyone that this is a real crab. I mean, he looks being red. He looks like he's been cooked already. Like I probably got one from a store and set it up. So I decided I better take a picture of one walking along so that you'd know that it was a legitimate uh, picture. This is what they look like. Um, and they are red like that. Kind of a cool thing to see. This was a fur lion, sea lion. 
the they're almost hunted to complete extinction. Right now, they have maybe 500 left, and they uh, again really got it and and um, uh, uh, general just got it against predator uh, people from doing anything that will harm them. They don't know because there are only 500 of them whether they're going to go extinct or whether they will recover. So uh, just not sure on that one. But this one was a, a newborn when we got there. Uh, he, they, uh, you can't see it, but uh, he still had his umbilical cord. So they figured he was no more than an hour old. So he and mom were just lying there in the sun. She's recovering from from giving birth, and the little one's trying to find out what's good. You know, introducing his, itself to the world. And they're on. You can see the lava flow that they're on. So, if you have your volume up, you'll hear them talking. But uh, that that was. Uh, Pretty cool to witness that, but mom was getting a little nervous, so we couldn't stick around. She, she, with a newborn, she was uh, yeah, obviously uh, protective. Uh, next stop was Rabada Island. You can tell from the red that's usually caused by iron in the uh, in the sand there. So uh, high content of iron. Again, you look here. Again, I was looking for more of a lush tropical uh, paradise. The little bit that's a green there is some of it is just a, a moss. There are some cactus mixed in, but I was just stunned at uh, how almost how barren it was uh, compared to what I was expecting. But there are some red uh, trees here. These are down near the ocean. They have a special uh, membrane that filters out the salt out of the water. So that allows them to stay green. And you can see down near the bottom, it's green, and then all of a sudden, it just goes up to a uh, uh, real barren uh, picture of uh, trees there. Dana, back on that picture, it's a little interesting how stubby the um, the little branchlets are. I'm, they're not full branches, but I'm going to say the branchlets. Is, yeah. is that just a function of the season that it is, and they'll get longer, or is it just because it's close to the ocean and that they're um i'm, I'm a not 100 not 100 percent sure i just know that they uh um when the water when it starts raining uh a friend of mine went there about in february we were there at the end of december and you know she's got different pictures than i have um you know she actually has leaves on the trees um this uh yeah i'm not sure exactly what the, what the uh, what those trees will look like, whether those will grow more as they uh, when the water hits or not. Thank you. Here are some uh, blue-footed boobies. Um, I did not name them. Uh, they uh, have the blue feet. They also have red-footed ones. We did not go to an island that had the red-footed uh, boobies on. But these guys are the, probably the most photographed uh, birds in the world, if not, well, definitely in the Galapagos. Now, here we are, we're right near the equator and, and look at all the snow that's there. Can you believe it? No, it's not really snow. Uh, it hasn't rained in six months there. So that's all bird poop. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to reproduce the sights and the sounds of the Galapagos. Uh, I've, I've been having trouble reproducing the smell, but uh, it is uh, it, it is an interesting place to visit. You can see how vivid his uh, blue feet are there. Their brains are specially uh, padded to uh, absorb a uh, the dive into the water. If the fish is down low, they go high and then they uh, go up higher, so they plunge deeper into the water. And uh, they, so they can, they somehow can spot the fish and judge how far they, how high they have to go to, to grab that fish. Uh, this is one of Darwin's finches. They have different birds on different islands. 
Darwin came to the conclusion, and he didn't know whether he was right or wrong, but he said that they all came from a common ancestor and they developed differently based on the food supply. Either they adapted or they died out. So, and you can tell how, when you see the different birds, they have different beaks. And it depends if they had, were, had uh, seeds there, they would uh, have a bigger beaks to, uh, to break open the seeds. Uh, they might have a longer one if they're going for insects or pollinating flowers. So they, uh, uh, they all adapted to the food source on the island. That was his theory. Now we have genetics and stuff like that. And uh, after analyzing all the birds, they found out that, uh, yeah, they all had a common ancestor, which was kind of interesting, I thought. You can see a cactus uh, finch there. Uh, he's, uh, and this one shows it a little better. He's getting into the flower there, pollinating the flower of the cactus. And then we had a lava heron. Now this guy was uh, uh, frozen. He did not move. I thought he, I didn't know he was alive at first. You know, he was just perfectly still. Now the tide is coming in and he's just waiting for a, a fish to some fish to come in with the tide and then he would pounce on them. But in the meantime, he's not moving. He's just waiting. And we had this Nazca uh, booby. He, uh, has uh, he looks like a bandit, like he's going to rob a uh, a a bank. Um, he is uh, standing there. Uh, he doesn't have the blue feet. He just has his claim to fame is the mask that he's wearing. I love the way these guys take off. I don't know if you uh, ever if it's when I was a kid, you'd watch uh, wide uh, Disney uh, World of Disney, and they'd go to uh, exotic places but they actually run across the water trying to get airspeed. So he's he's coming up and you can see the splashing on the water behind the bird as he's trying to get uh, enough speed up to get airborne. He's flapping and, and moving his uh, running across the water until he finally gets airborne. Now, like I said, they depend on how, these guys are wondering how high they have to get to uh, to plunge into the water. And I did mention their uh, brains especially padded to handle the uh, concussion of hitting the water. So you see them, they're just going over, the three of them are wondering where the fish are, getting the height. And all three of them go in at the same time. It was pretty cool, we were watching them. They were just doing that over and over and over again. It, uh, uh, I, I could have watched that for hours. Now, there are four different ocean currents that influence the uh, Galapagos. One comes up from Antarctica and the others from the other compass points. But the uh, cause, because of so much in, different influences, there's over 500 different types of uh, fish and uh, penguins and seals and all that stuff in the uh, living in, in the waters. Uh, on this one, these people are gonna swim out and they get, they're getting ready to go snorkeling. They wanna see uh, like a, a sea lion up close and personal. And I wanted to yell at them and tell them, turn around because if you look behind them, you can see a sea lion just went right by, right, right behind them when they were uh, getting ready. He's probably looking at them wondering what what is that, you know, but, uh, uh, it was uh, kind of interesting. They they were going to swim out to see him, and he came in to see them. On Isabella Island, we came across some uh, ocean turtles, and uh, there was one who was just paralleling the beach that we were on, and he had come up and down, and about that fast, too. Uh, he had just come up, grabbed some air, and down. And uh, so what I did is I just... Uh, if I was shooting film, I probably wouldn't have done this, but with digital, it's great. You just delete everything. Uh, I just took about, oh, maybe 30 shots about where I figured he would come up. And I eventually caught this one of him. These are comorants. 
Darwin was familiar with comorants. They fly around all the time where he, is, where he was from, but these do not fly. They came to the islands million, two million years ago, and there's no predators. There's no predators for them to fly away from. So their wings actually atrophied. They are excellent swimmers, and that's where they get most of their food. They go for food, they come up, then they have to dry their wings. So they hold their wings out while the breeze goes along and dries their wings. But I thought this one was cool. He was going by us, and to me, he looked like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, just the way he's just just his head showing, uh, it, it, the rest of the body is under, under, and he's ready to dive. But we were in this little bay, and this bay was just teeming with wildlife. Uh, but, you know, we saw some seals, we saw the comorances, there were penguins there. Uh, but uh, these were blue-footed boobies, and they were having a feeding frenzy. There must have been a, a school of fish there. So we're just floating around, bobbing up and down and uh, taking these uh, and watching this. It was just absolutely amazing. I got this picture. You can see the one at the top's looking for a fish and the other two have found their target that are going in and they tuck themselves down almost like an arrow and they go right into the water head first, just boom. And uh, it was just amazing. And he's right next to us. Uh, it was... Uh, uh, to, to sit there and watch that was incredible. So this one looks like it's out of focus, but it's not. So I get some pictures of them just kind of flying around. They're looking for some fish to, to eat. You know, maybe they'll find some, maybe they won't. If they do, then splash. They all go in. Uh, that was just amazing. And it was like over and over and over again. Now I've given this talk enough time, so I know most people say, can I see that again? So I'm gonna just do it one more time. You'll see some more at the end, of, if I have time, if I don't run out of time. So they just come in and then all of them go in at once. It, it was just like a, a amazing watching that. Uh, who was giving them the, uh, you know, the cue that now is the time to go in. This one, if you want to turn off your uh, sound on this one, uh, yeah, maybe uh, or turn it down. There's nothing of value there. Uh, that's my wife uh, with her. That was her sleep. So it's just, we were just sitting there watching these guys. And a couple of times, we, I was hoping they would repeat what they were doing. So I was sort of ready for it. Again, they they come around and they came up near the boat which was uh, amazing. I had to uh, pull back a little bit to, uh, to, to get them. I wish I had, I, I, I wish I was doing a wider angle right then, but here they come, they're coming around the, the, near the boat and they all start going in and you can see how they tuck themselves in and they go in. Well, this was like watching an artillery barrage. They just went right across the way. I just, just followed them right across as they were going in. I think they probably were scaring the fish and they would, the fish would take off and then they would uh, catch up to them. You see them go in and then a couple seconds later, you see them come bobbing up from the, uh, from the ocean. Yeah, not too much more left on that one. Um, so then we got in there and we saw some of the, uh, Penguins. These are the second smallest penguins in the world. They uh, must have got their ancestor again a million two years ago. Probably jumped on an ice floe. Seemed like a good idea at the time, and the current brought them up from Antarctica up to the Galapagos, and they uh, settled there. But they had to adapt, and that's very important. Uh, how are they gonna have nests? Their young don't like it hot. Well, what they do is they find these lava tubes that go underground and uh, the lava would, will sometimes form uh, tubes. What they would do is they go down to the bottom of them, they make their nest where it's cool. Then they come out and they dive in the water. They've got, uh, like I said, uh, 500 different types of uh, fish there. 
uh, take their choice of what they want to eat that day, and they're ready to uh, to bring it back to their nest. And you can see they get along well with the uh, sea lion behind them. There's a couple more. Uh, this guy's got his tuxedo on. He's all ready to party. Now, uh, Darwin was familiar with iguanas, and they don't go in the water. But these are marine iguanas, and they actually eat plankton. They uh, so they uh, uh, you know there's a male with all, with the females there, and they are cold blooded. They do have to sun themselves to raise their body temperature. I was lucky enough, like the very first picture I took there was this one, and he was uh, an iguana, uh, marine, marine iguana who was making his way out to. Uh, grab a little something to eat but they they look vicious they look uh like uh no one you'd want to meet in a dark alley but they uh actually all they eat is plankton they they won't attack you or anything like that the sea lions will but not that one another darwin finch uh, i tried to take pictures as uh, many of the different birds i could Bird, taking pictures of birds i tell you i have so many pictures of branches it's like just as you go click the bird takes off. Uh, it uh, can be quite frustrating sometimes, but uh, this guy posed for me for a while. So on uh, San Diego Island, this is a large lava flow that was uh, uh, from an eruption uh, about 100 years ago. And they had strict requirements when you were out there. Well, suggestions, I not say they require. They want you to wear regular shoes, tied shoes, uh, not flip-flops, and you probably should wear jeans or long pants, uh, not shorts. So uh, we uh, had a uh, teenager that was on not uh, that was there with her uh, with their family, uh, her family, and she had shorts and she had her nice little flip-flops, and she tripped and she fell on something like this. Well. This had a texture of uh, broken glass and sandpaper type of texture, and when she landed on it, uh, it did quite a number. Uh, it was she was it was very impressive, like a pretty good road rash all on her uh, right side, uh, face, arm, and leg. Uh, it, you know, she should have had she shouldn't have worn flip flops on when you're walking on uh, terrain like that, uh, but. Uh, when the lava flows, it sometimes will make these uh, little formations like, and this is called rope lava. And uh, it was uh, pretty cool to see how Mother Nature uh, is such an artist at times. But this area is just starting now to get some plant life. It's been 100 years. There are a couple of different plants that are starting to grow there. They will start to break that lava up. And if we go back there in like say 10,000 years, it'll be a nice sandy beach. But they are uh, slowly, slowly starting to uh, come along. Like I said, it'll take thousands, tens of thousands of, of years. This is uh, Bataloma Island. Uh, we could uh, have the opportunity. Uh, well, they always, the ship always offered two tours. You could take the, strenuous tour or you could take the sissy tour so they said how many people want the strenuous tour and my wife raised her hand and said we do and I, i'm like wait whoa, whoa what's this we 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 aren't gonna do this so uh she ended up climbing to the top of that well, while i took the sissy tour uh which went around in a zodiac around the island and uh so she walked to the top of that i asked her how it was and she said, I thought I was going to die. Uh, they had a boardwalk that you go up in stairs, about 400 stairs with a railing. And she said she was using the railing to try to pull herself up the stairs. But she did make it. Uh, she was not about to give up, but she made it. But she, <laughs> she was not happy. Let's put it that way. So meanwhile, I took the sissy tour and I got to see a, a, a heron. And uh, then what I thought was kind of neat was uh, these tracks, these lines in the sand. 
And those are marine iguanas tracks. They come out uh, to, remember they have to sun themselves because they're cold blooded. And they would come out of the ocean and then they would go up those, uh, that hillside and leave those tracks. This is Pinnacle Rock. Uh, it has appeared in a few movies, uh, Master and Commander with uh, uh, Russell Crowe uh, was uh, uh, one of the movies that I saw. They did say, oh yeah, it was filmed here. So my wife and I rented the movie and out of the 90 minute movie, maybe five minutes was filmed live at the uh, on location. The rest of it was done in a studio. Is it another island, another different type of finch. Again, they all develop differently. This one's a yellow wobbler. This one was kind of cool. Uh, very high. He moved around. He never stood still. Uh, he just stopped for a second, and I just managed to nail it. Uh, uh, but pretty bird, but uh, they don't stick around too, in one spot too often. And this is a ghost trap crab, Galapagos ghost crab, only found in the Galapagos. Uh, it was easy to see why he was named that. I took that picture, and right after that, he disappeared into the sand, and I never saw another one. I mean, he just disappeared. Uh, it was uh, pretty uh, amazing how he, how fast he got underground uh, to uh, into safety if he felt threatened by us. And this is your typical seagull, but we call he's called a lava gull. Because there's so much black lava there, he uh, they have uh, developed uh, black uh, so that they can blend in. Not that they have really a lot of predators, but uh, it's just how Mother Nature took care of it. You can see that the, the lava rocks that are right near him, he's quite similar in color. There's actually flamingos there. They only have about 300 of them on the Galapagos Islands. And that's because there's not much habitat that they will live in. They don't like salt water. They don't like fresh water. They want it brackish water. So they uh, they don't live in too many spots. I was, our guide said, okay, let's go. And he starts walking away, uh, leading us uh, up the trail. And I was like the last one, Kathy and I are still trying to get a better shot. Can we get a better shot of these guys? Cause they were kind of far away. And while we were there, all of a sudden, these guys flew in. We were the only ones that were facing the direction of that of that uh, little pond. Everybody else was walking away back towards the ocean, back towards the beach. So uh, I had to ask the guy, a guide, I said, what type of bird is this? And he told me, uh, black-necked uh, stilt. And he said, where the heck did you see that? And so I told him, and I said, you, you guys missed him by about 30 seconds. Now you see these four wheel drive tracks going up the sand. Uh, they're not four wheel drive, those are uh, sea turtle tracks. They would, uh, the sea turtles get up uh, there and they uh, lay their eggs in the nests. Now, how many of you have seen a turtle nest and would know one if they saw one? And probably most of you are the same as I am. Yeah, wouldn't have a clue. That's why we have the guides. And when we actually walked in that area, but we had to walk in exactly where he walked. We could not go to the left or the right. We had to walk exactly where he walked. Otherwise we would have trampled and killed a bunch of turtles. So uh, it was well worth it. They, they, they guides keep track of everything, you know, and you want to make sure some idiots not uh, having a piece of candy and throwing the wrapper there or something. I mean, everything was, was, uh, uh, Everybody uh, kept an eye on everybody else, so nothing was disturbed. Again, I took this one on Santa Cruz Island. I was just like, where are the leaves? Where is the tropical paradise? Well, we came across this guy. And uh, I said, well, I came up with one of my good ideas that I sometimes have that sometimes aren't that good. But I said, if I get down on my stomach, I might be able to get a real cool shot of him. So I got down on my stomach and then I realized, what if he starts walking towards me? You know, I mean, we were closer than I really wanted to be. This was not with a telephoto, um, you know, and I said, like, if he can't stumps, 
it's not going to be a pretty sight if he starts walking towards me. It's it's going to be quite embarrassing. But uh, I did get this picture of him. He did look at me and smile. So I did get a good picture of him. Some of these, these animals, uh, the iguanas can actually drink salt water. And the uh, they have special glands that filter out the salt. And it comes out their nose. Uh, it's kind of impressive if you see a video of it. This is a magnificent frigate. It can get to be about seven feet in wingspan. They can stay up uh, if they're just floating along with the currents. They can stay up 24 hours if they're hunting for food. Um, they are quite a spectacular bird. They will try to steal a lot of the uh, food from the boobies if possible. Why, why hunt for it if you can steal it? Now, this one is uh, we got surprised. We're walking along, and the nest was right next to the trail. And I'm, I was a little bit uh, afraid, I'll admit, um, to have a, a bird that big right next to you, you know. But he, the bird did not see us as a threat. But if you look under the bird, if you look at that white spot, she has a baby. She has a baby bird there. And uh, so I would think that the bird would be very protective and that we would be in big trouble being as close no more than five feet away from that bird and uh in the nest and it was kind of uh like i said a little uh nerve-wracking i just we just kept walking quick took a picture and started walking now where we the other one had a baby this guy's a teenager he hasn't got his uh, wings flying wings yet but he's a lot bigger and he's uh he's getting them but the nest is made by the male. The male uh, builds a nest, and then he's got to advertise to the young ladies and let them know, hey, I got this nice swinging pad here. You know, so uh, uh, he what he does is he has a pouch under his chin, and he fills it with air. And it's this bright red pou pouch that you can see here. And he's just advertising to the ladies that he's got a real nice nest there. Come on down and check it out. Uh, we this was called the cathedral. You could go in here. I tried to. I took about I don't know twenty or thirty shots trying to get the waves crashing in, but I was uh, not successful. But we took our uh, little boat in there, uh, Zodiac. And uh, if you want to feel insignificant in the world, this is the place to go. Now uh, you can see this next picture. Uh, if you look up the top, hopefully you can see where I'm pointing with my arrow. That's the top, and you can see down below is the uh, zodiac going in with the people, and you can see exactly how big that, how tall. When you're going in there, that just towers over you. It is really impressive. But if you're on the beach, you got to share it with the natives. Uh, so this was a, a continuous uh, program. Uh, problem well a good problem because that's what we were there for but uh, if you wanted to have your picture taken your best bet is to go behind them stoop down and the picture would be taken it would look like you're near them but uh when you're really uh, quite a few feet away uh you can see the little baby in the foreground there nursing with mom american oyster catches from the usa they uh came to the Galapagos, they spent their winters there, and then they go back to California when it warms up. One, well, with El Nino and climate change, there's a lot of oysters there all year round now. So they these guys have moved in. You see the three of them there? So the three of them uh, stay there now all the time. Uh, everybody see three? No, no. There's the third one right there. That's what he looks like. So he is, uh, um, just, they have a little baby. You can see him on the lower left. He's right here. You can see his beak just about that. The rest of them blends right into the to the lava so that you, you can barely see him. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are three there. Now we're on a different island and they had a mockingbird, but it's different than the Galapagos mockingbird. This one's called a Chatham mockingbird. Again, I'm sorry, I don't know what they, uh, what the, um, I'm not a big bird person, you know, so uh, 
Uh, there are some people who could look at that and tell you whether it was male, female, and all that, but uh, all I can do is tell you it was a Chatham Mockingbird. And this is one of the tortoises. This One of his ancestors would have fed the whalers. Uh, the, as he gets older, you can see the ridges on his uh, shell. As he gets older, those ridges and wrinkles smooth out. Because as we get older, we get more and more wrinkles. His go away. So uh, he, they just eat grass. He's in an area where it was a, a farm for a cow pasture, basically, as we were out. And when we got there, they said, oh, put these boots on. Take your shoes off, put boots on. Uh, because of the uh, bird, uh, the cow poop and tortoises all over the place. You had to watch where you stepped. Um, but uh, they were a decent size. You can see uh, there I am with my favorite model and, uh, and the tortoise. And he's a dome tortoise. The, he's got a different shape to him. So you can see where his head is. It's more of a, a dome area. Now he actually, we thought, we saw so many of them in this area. We thought that they raised them there, but they really don't. Uh, this was, they actually go there during the rainy, uh, go in the dry season because there's more uh, moisture up there and the grass is green and they can eat. And they, uh, uh, they uh, live there with the cows. Now, when you, there is a building code. If you put up a fence, the bottom rung of the fence has to be so many inches tall. And that's to allow the tortoises free range. If you don't want to do that, you can put it lower. But if a tortoise wants to get on the other side, they are quite powerful and they will pull down your whole, uh, the whole fence. So uh, they want you, they have uh, pretty good guidelines on how you will protect these animals. But notice this one's called a saddleback tortoise. We saw him at one of the uh, preservation conservation areas. Notice his um, shell. It's sort of like a, a saddle, shaped like a, a, uh, a saddle. And he's found on a specific island. They all have their own islands, which is kind of interesting. And after Darwin realized that, that they all had the different shapes, he came to the conclusion that they adapted based on their food supply. This, the island that this tortoise comes from, the food supply is very high and he has to reach up for it. And if he does, if he can't reach up for it, uh, you know, they would die out. The ones that could lived and eventually they uh, evolved so that the shell was shaped like this. Now we were uh, out on the ship. I'm at the, on the railing of the ship. And uh, looking over, there was uh, every once in a while, you'd see a shark go by. But there were a bunch of fish, a lot of fish there. So the boobies are going in for it. They, they, they were feasting like crazy. They were, you can see how they're getting, uh, some of them have gone in. And since I'm looking down at them, you can see how they leave a trail of bubbles when they go in the water. It's quite impressive. You'll see that in just a minute. And you can see when they're taking off, you see the little splashes when they're, as they're trying to run to get airspeed. This one's pretty, pretty cool because you do get the, uh, get to see how they go in and how they leave those uh, like torpedo tracks almost. And then when they go to take off, they uh, just splash through the water. They are the cutest birds. They were, we were there for about an hour or so, and, and the birds, were, we just happened to be there, and the fish happened to be there, and lucked out by having the uh, uh, the birds feasting. That's a pelican that's just flying in now. He probably was being scavenging. He might have found a piece of fish that was uh, left behind. But that was pretty cool watching that. Now, this one is tough to see. If you look to the right, you'll see this black area. If I had a, a different polarized lens on this, you would see it a lot better. But uh, it's a school of fish. And they're, they're going to the left, they're going to the right. At one point, they uh, divided into two different groups, and then they came back again. It was quite interesting watching it. 
And the biggest problem that they have right now, and you'll see it in just a second, is right there. There's a sea lion feasting on them. And you wouldn't believe how long. He was there for an hour and a half, two hours, just trying to catch fish. He did catch one. I saw him eating one. But uh, he uh, he was just up and down, going for one, trying to grab one, coming up, going back down again. I mean, I, I, he, I would have sent out to McDonald's or something for a fish sandwich, but, you know, it's amazing how they, uh, how perseverant he was. He just was not giving up. He was just going to uh, keep going and up and down and grab one. I wish I had the picture of the video going when he actually caught one, but unfortunately I did not have it going at that time. And it was pretty spectacular to, to watch. So I think that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. We The sun sets on all of our vacations, unfortunately. So uh, I have no problem if anyone has any questions or I'll tell you what we, the little bit that I know. I'm not a, a naturalist, but I did pick up a few pointers when I was there. I won't be shy. This is the other Dana again. Um, hey. I'm assuming that you just stay on the ship and that's sort of yeah. your hotel, if you will. Yeah, there's a couple of different uh, tours. There's one that you can go on island hopping and stuff like that. And then you stay at a hotel. But uh, uh, we just we didn't want to pack and unpack. We're lazy. Uh, so uh, we took the, the ship and I mean, we just saw such incredible things. Uh, it, it's uh um uh, the experiences and how close it, it, the thing is how close you can get to the animals and you just have to keep in the back of your mind that they're wild and you don't want to get too close to some of the uh uh sea lions they will take a bite out of you yeah interesting thank you other questions Huh? Come on, Steve, ask me a question. I see Steve is there. Steve and Tara, maybe? He asks a question. He says, fascinating. Did you do any magnet fishing when you were there? <laughs> no, I didn't have a magnet at that time. Uh, for those of you who Steve uh, introduced me to that, you get a very powerful magnet and attach it to a string, throw it out. And rather than fishing for fish, you drag it along the bottom and see what you uh, come up with. Steve was fortunate <laughs> enough to he was fortunate enough to get a uh, a hearing aid. A hearing aid. Still looking for the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> that was good, Dana. Very good. Oh, thanks. Excellent. I, I, Steve does talks on astronomy. Uh, so uh, if you ever need a talk on astronomy, he he has some fantastic pictures that he's taken. Wonderful. I'll be out there right after this talk. There's a comet out there tonight. But anyhow, oh, really? Yeah, Tara and I enjoyed this show immensely, right, Tara? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, Anybody else with comments or questions? It it looks to me like the water is just absolutely pristine that you can see everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, and, you know, like I said, they, they're very strict, uh, you know, the ships uh, on how they get rid of their garbage and everything else. Uh, um, uh, we were uh, um, very impressed. They, like I said, they're very. They didn't realize they have quite a uh, resource here, and they got it uh, jealously. Understandable. Uh, just amazing. Um, Anybody else? Any other questions or comments for Dana? I'll let like this play a little bit more. It makes some background noise, but. Uh, Well, you can just shut off the little sound if you want. But it was just amazing. You're just out there and uh, and just watching the the fish and then uh, and the birds in their natural habitat. All right, Dana. If you don't have any more questions, do you see lots of other ships out there, or is it really you're pretty much in isolation? I know you put those stats up. Um, in the beginning, saying that it, we had to be a hundred or fewer people, but do you see lots of other ships? 
Uh, you see some, but there's a lot of cabin cruises like that, that only have 16 people on them. Uh, yeah. Bigger, bigger, bigger uh, cabin cruises. But uh, um, they, uh, uh, we saw a bunch of those. We didn't see may maybe one or two bigger ships. Um, but if you wanted to go there, you have to, be, they limit the number of people that are uh, allowed there. So you have to uh, get your reservations in now for next year. Hmm. Amazing. Well, thank you again. We'll see you pretty soon doing um, your um, program on Ireland. We'll all look forward to that. Ah, yeah. And we can um, St. Patrick's Day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, I'll say thank you and wish everybody a nice evening. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Dana. This was fantastic. All right. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Good night, everybody. You too.